So when it comes to Pan Am, the airline, well, there's a lot to unpack there. Many have come to me asking me to talk about that company's downfall, as it was a pretty major thing, and I have talked about the fall of plenty of companies at this point. But the thing about Pan Am, and talking about the company's downfall, is that there's a lot of mitigating factors here. A lot of things that weren't necessarily in their control and require their own videos to properly explain. So, to begin, I'm gonna make a few other videos detailing other events that contributed to Pan Am's downfall before I talk about the core company. And the first, and arguably most major thing, was the destruction of Pan Am Flight 103. This was a disaster, but you may never have heard of it if you're outside of the UK these days. And you should, because this is in fact the deadliest terrorist attack in the history of the United Kingdom. Yes, this was a terrorist attack. This was no accident. This plane was destroyed on purpose and resulted in the death of 270 people. Before we get to the attack itself, let's first discuss the aircraft involved. She was a Boeing 747-121, serial number 19646, registered as N739PA. And she actually had a name, interestingly enough, which is pretty unusual for commercial airliners. She was named Clipper Maid of the Seas, though prior to 1979 she had a different name, Clipper Morning Light. But in either form, it was a quite pretty name. And Clipper, by the way, is something directly associated with Pan Am, but that's a separate topic. Regardless, she had been in service for quite some time, first flying January 25th, 1970, and was actually the 15th 747 built in general. She was first delivered to Pan Am on February 15th of 1970, and had been a fine aircraft. The 747 family I don't think needs any introduction. They're arguably one of the best commercial airliners ever constructed. So there were absolutely no issues with her prior to or on the date of this crash. As for the flight itself, well, 103 actually started as a feeder flight at Frankfurt Airport over in West Germany. And on that leg of the flight, they actually didn't use the 747. They used a 727 under flight number PA-103A. This was normal at the time. Both Pan Am and Transworld routinely changed the type of aircraft operating different legs of certain flights, particularly longer ones, as 103's final destination was over in America across the Atlantic. In this instance, Detroit, though there would also be a stop in New York. So, in total, the flight would hit four different airports, flying from Frankfurt to London, to New York, to Detroit. It was over the UK, having just left Heathrow Airport in London, Terminal 3. As part of the normal transfer of people and goods, the passengers and their luggage, as well as, more intrinsically, an unaccompanied suitcase, which was part of the interline luggage on the feeder flight, were transferred directly over to Clipper Maid of the Seas for the next leg of the journey. Maid of the Seas had already crossed the Atlantic just before. She had originated from Los Angeles, heading to San Francisco, and then flying all the way over to London. And as I said, there was nothing wrong with her at all. She was fine. And some sources say she actually left the terminal late, but that isn't even true. She was scheduled to leave at 1800, and pulled back at 1804. So if you consider just four minutes past schedule late, then I guess, but no. I think most of us would see that as a perfectly reasonable time to depart, given when she was scheduled. She took off from runway 27R at 1825, under the command of Captain James B. Macquarie, who was 55 years old. He had worked for Pan Am since 1964 and had nearly 11,000 flight hours. 4,000 of those were in 747s. Prior to working for Pan Am, he had served three years in the U.S. Navy and five years in the Massachusetts Air National Guard, where he held the rank of Major. So he was definitely an accredited individual. The first officer, Raymond R. Wagner, who was 52 years old, had been a pilot with Pan Am since 1966 with almost 5,500 flight hours in just the 747. He also had a total of 12,000 flight hours, even more than the captain, interestingly enough. He'd also served eight years in the New Jersey National Guard. The flight engineer was Jerry D. Everett, 46 years old, who had joined Pan Am in 1980 after serving 13 years with National Airlines. He had more than 8,000 hours of flying time, 500 in 747s. 
So all told, the crew was perfectly qualified. There was no reason to expect anything to go wrong. The plane was fine, the crew was great, passengers were on board, luggage was on board. Everything should have been going okay. And at first, everything seemed normal. At 1858, Maid of the Seas established contact with the Shanwick Oceanic Air Control in Prestwick via two-way radio, and then approached the corner of Solway Firth at 1901, crossing over the coast at 1902. She showed a transponder code, or squawk as it's sometimes referred to, of 0357, as well as a flight level of 310. At that time, she was operating at 31,000 feet, 9,400 meters, on a heading of 316 degrees magnetic, and going at a speed of 313 knots, that's 580 kilometers per hour, or 360 miles per hour. Though that's calibrated airspeed, which is indicated airspeed corrected for instrument and position error. Subsequent analysis shows she was probably more like 434 knots, 803 kilometers per hour, or 499 miles per hour, but still nothing out of the ordinary. However, at 1902-44, a man named Alan Topp, who was an airways controller at Scottish Air Traffic Control Center, transmitted the oceanic route clearance on behalf of Shanwick. Which is again nothing unusual, but what was unusual is that the aircraft didn't acknowledge that message. It was then observed that Clipper Maid of the Seas squawk flickered off. That indicated something was very wrong. Air traffic control, of course, tried to make contact with the flight, but never got a response. Then, at 1902.50, a loud noise was recorded on the cockpit voice recorder. And alarmingly, five different radar echoes appeared and fanned out from the flight's last known position, instead of just one. A few minutes later, a British Airways pilot, who was flying the London-Glasgow shuttle near Carlisle, got a hold of Scottish authorities to report that he could see a massive fire on the ground. What in the world happened? Well, simply put, a bomb. As I said, this was not an accident. This plane was intentionally destroyed. And it was a bomb that had gone off and punched a 50 centimeter or 20 inch hole in the left side of the fuselage. The following investigation by the FAA concluded that no emergency procedures had actually been started in the cockpit after the explosion, but in this instance, the crew likely had no time to do anything, not even a distress call. The cockpit voice recorder was found pretty quick, within 24 hours after the incident, and after the explosion, a 180 millisecond hissing noise could be heard as it tore through the aircraft's communications center. So even if they tried to call for help, there was no way for it to get through. And really, there was nothing they could do to save this flight. The explosion itself wasn't necessarily the biggest problem. What was the problem was that it caused uncontrolled decompression of the fuselage. This resulted in a pretty extensive chain reaction. The aircraft's elevator, as well as rudder control cables, had been disrupted, causing the plane to pitch downwards and to the left. The nose of the aircraft was also blown off pretty much immediately and separated within three seconds. It was apparently briefly held on by a band of metal facing aft and then sheared off, up, and backwards to starboard, striking the number three engine. Without the nose, the fuselage continued moving forward and down until it reached 19,000 feet when the dive wound up being nearly vertical. If the crew was still trying to do anything at this point, it didn't matter. Due to the extreme flutter, the vertical stabilizer had actually disintegrated, and that caused large yawing movements. The forward fuselage was also falling apart, and the debris tore off both the horizontal stabilizers, while the rear fuselage and the remaining three engines, as well as the thin torque box, ripped off. The rear part of the fuselage, parts of the baggage hold, as well as three landing gear units landed at Rosebank Crescent. The fuselage consisting of the main wing box structure landed at Sherwood Crescent, and that one destroyed three homes and left a large impact crater. 200,000 pounds of jet fuel ignited, which destroyed several additional houses. The plane hit the ground with such force that the British Geological Survey 23 kilometers away, registered a seismic event, measuring 1.6 on the moment magnitude scale. The fuselage forward, and many things attached to it, was found in one piece in a field 4 kilometers east of Lockerbie. Those images are most easily identified with the accident in the media. It was likely used for two reasons. One, you didn't have to see the destroyed homes in many of those, and 
you could actually still kind of tell it was originally an airplane. Every single person on board the plane died. 243 passengers and 16 crew members. Given that some of the wreckage fell in residential areas of Lockerbie, 11 residents were also killed. 190 of the victims were American citizens, and 43 were British citizens, though 19 other nationalities were also represented in the disaster. The captain, first officer, flight engineer, as well as a flight attendant, and several first-class passengers were actually found still strapped into their seats inside the forward fuselage section. A local farmer's wife found a flight attendant still alive, but she unfortunately died before help got there. Several of the passengers may have also been alive briefly after the impact, according to pathologist reports, but emergency response didn't get there soon enough, so they would pass as well. 35 of the passengers were actually students of Syracuse University, who had participated in the Division of International Programs Abroad. They were returning home for Christmas following a semester in Syracuse's London and European campuses. After all, Christmas was just a few days away. This all happened on December 21st, 1988. The response to the disaster was swift, but at first, mostly filled with a lot of confusion. Many family members had to fly across the Atlantic to identify their loved ones' bodies, showing up within days. But in one bright spot of wholesomeness, the town of Lockerbie got together and volunteered to set up and staff canteens, which wound up staying open 24 hours a day offering relatives, soldiers, police officers, and social workers free sandwiches, hot meals, beverages, and even counseling. The townsfolk also washed, dried, and ironed every piece of clothing that was found once the police had determined that they had no forensic value, and this was so that as many items as possible could be returned to relatives. Ultimately, all this was a small comfort to those who had lost their family members, but at the same time, it was a comfort and the residents of Lockerbie should take pride in that. Now, there's a lot to unravel when it comes to the exact cause and who was responsible for the bombing. But the thing was, there were actually two alerts to a potential attack prior to this. On December 5th, 1988, just 16 days before it happened, the FAA issued a security bulletin stating that a man with an Arabic accent had telephoned the U.S. Embassy in Helsinki, Finland, telling them that a Pan Am flight from Frankfurt to the United States would be blown up within the next two weeks by someone associated with the Abu Nadal organization, which was a Palestinian militant group founded in 1974. He explained that a Finnish woman would carry the bomb on board as an unwitting courier. This warning was taken seriously by the U.S. government and the State Department, who sent the information to dozens of different embassies. The FAA sent the information to all U.S. carriers, including Pan Am. Pan Am, by the way, had been charging each of their passengers a $5 surcharge. The reason for this was security. They said it was for a program that will screen passengers, employees, airport facilities, baggage, and airport with unrelenting thoroughness. But the security team in Frankfurt found this particular warning under a pile of papers on a desk the day after the bombing. So, what was the $5 charge for? Serious question. And one of the security screeners in Frankfurt, whose job was specifically to spot explosive devices under X-ray, wound up admitting to ABC News that she had only learned what Semtex was. A plastic explosive, mind you during her ABC interview 11 months after the bombing. You have one job, lady. I'm not sure I can even blame you. Did your bosses not give you proper training? Obviously not! On December 13th, the warning was posted on bulletin boards in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, and eventually distributed to the entire American community there. And even besides that, there was also PLO's warning. Just a few days before the bombing, security forces in European countries that included the UK were all put on alert after a warning came from the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, who told them that extremists might actually launch terrorist attacks to undermine the then ongoing dialogue between themselves and the United States. 
they were actually having a good talk at the time that might result in some serious positive changes. But of course, terrorists don't like that and just want to kill people. So, you know, yeah. During the investigation at the crash site, a Samsonite suitcase that was believed to have contained the bomb was recovered, at least fragments of it, as well as parts and pieces from a circuit board that was identified as components of a Toshiba Bomb Beat RTSF-16 radio cassette player. This sort of device was familiar to investigators, as it had also been used to conceal another Semtex bomb that had been seized by West German police from the Palestinian militant group PLOGC just two months before. But who was really responsible? Was it these Palestinian extremists? Well, not exactly. After a three-year joint investigation between Dumfries and Galloway Constabulary, as well as the United States' FBI, which included interviewing 15,000 witnesses, they finally issued indictments for murder on November 13th, 1991 against Abdelbesset al-Megrahi, who was a Libyan intelligence officer, as well as the head of security for Libyan Arab Airlines, or LAA, as well as another man named Laman Khalifa Fahima, who was the LAA station manager in Lakha Airport, but they couldn't actually put them on trial for nearly a decade because Libyan leader, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, refused to give them up. But sanctions against Libya, as well as protracted negotiations with Gaddafi, eventually secured a handover of the accused on April 5th, 1999, to Scottish police at Camp Zeist in the Netherlands, which was selected as a neutral venue for their trial. Neither of the accused parties chose to give any evidence in court, and on January 31st, 2001, McGrahi was convicted of murder by a panel of three Scottish judges and sentenced to life, though Fahima was actually acquitted. McGrahi tried to appeal, but that was refused on March 14th, 2002, and he also sent an application to the European Court of Human Rights, which was declared inadmissible in July of 2003. On September 23rd, 2003, he applied to the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission for his conviction to be reviewed, and on June 28th, 2007, they did announce their decision to refer the case to the High Court of Justiciary in Edinburgh after it found he actually may have suffered a miscarriage of justice. McGrawhee wound up serving just over 10 years of his sentence. During the whole time, he maintained that he was innocent, that he had nothing to do with this, and he was actually released from prison on compassionate grounds on August 20th, 2009. This is because he'd been diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer, and he was sent back home to Libya. He did live beyond the approximate three-month prognosis he had, and during the remaining part of his life, he published evidence on the internet that was gathered for an abandoned second appeal, which he claimed would clear his name. Now, his release is also a big controversy because, for obvious reasons, the families involved were just a little miffed by this, because he'd been found guilty of murdering a whole bunch of people. Allegations have been made that the United Kingdom's government, as well as BP, British Petroleum, sought the release as part of a trade deal with Libya, which has never been proven conclusively, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that might have been a motivational factor. McGrahi would eventually die of his cancer in Libya on May 20th, 2012. But here's the thing, investigations regarding this attack are still ongoing even to this day, because... Everyone involved, including those in charge and government, were pretty sure that this dude had not acted alone. For one thing, it was suspected that Gaddafi's government may have been directly involved, even ordering the attack. There's no proof of that, and Gaddafi never admitted this, but on August 16th, 2003, he did admit responsibility in a letter presented to the President of the United Nations Security Council. He never admitted he directly ordered it, but that members of his government carried it out, therefore leading to some responsibility on their part. The motive here is believed to be because of a series of military confrontations with the United States Navy that took place in the 1980s in the Gulf of Sidra, which Libya was claiming as its territorial waters. Even before Flight 103, Gaddafi was accused of retaliating to several exchanges with the U.S. Navy by ordering the April 1986 bombing of Labelle, which was a West Berlin nightclub, known to be frequented by U.S. military personnel. That particular bombing killed three and injured 230. He's also been linked to the bombing of Flight 772, 
Which is a whole different story, but that was a plane operating for the French airline, Union des Transports Ariens, and it killed 170 people. Back on February 23rd, 2011, during the Libyan Civil War, Mustafa Abdul Jalil, who was the former Libyan Justice Minister, and later a member and chairman of the anti-Gaddafi National Transition Council, had alleged that he had evidence that Gaddafi had personally ordered al Magrari to bomb Flight 103, and even Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, said in a July 2021 interview that while he didn't know for sure, he noted that his father had stopped riding his horse after the humiliation of the American bombing of Tripoli in 1986, and he resumed riding it after the bombing of Flight 103. So, it's hard to say. There's no direct evidence, but there's a lot of suggestions that Gaddafi at least knew that the attack was going to happen if he didn't order it himself. There's also been a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding the whole thing, particularly involving the Palestinian organization, Abu Nadal, as they were the ones that made the threat. And even some suggest Iranian involvement, suggesting they may have aided the Palestinians. But officials don't think so, because Iranian and Palestinian groups weren't actually close back then, and Hezbollah and the Iranian government at the time loudly opposed attacks on unarmed civilians. In those days, they probably wouldn't have supported this kind of attack at all, and there's no actual evidence that links them directly to the attack whatsoever. Libya, when they accepted some responsibility, did offer up $2.7 billion to settle claims by the families of those killed in the bombing. As part of the deal, Libya gave 40% of the money when the United Nations sanctions that were suspended in 1999 were officially cancelled. Another 40% was going to be given when U.S. trade sanctions were lifted, and the final 20% would be given when the U.S. State Department removed Libya from its list of states sponsoring terrorism. They wouldn't actually do that until May 15, 2006. As far as how this all affected Pan Am, well, one could argue this really wasn't their fault, this was a terrorist attack. But at the same time, as I mentioned during that explanation, they were charging people for a security fee and then not actually giving proper security. Their personnel weren't even properly trained to spot plastic explosives. In 1992, a U.S. federal court found Pan Am guilty due to all this by not implementing baggage reconciliation, which was actually a new security program mandated by the FAA prior to the incident that could have prevented it. It required unaccompanied luggage to be searched by hand and to ensure passengers board flights onto which they have actually checked baggage. Pan Am was using the older and less effective x-ray screening, and even that wasn't really being done right. They weren't the only ones subject to violations, but they were fined for it, and it did contribute to their overall downfall. But as recently as 2020, the investigation into those responsible for this are still ongoing. That year, U.S. authorities indicted a Libyan national named Abu Ajila Mohammed Masud Kir al-Marimi. He's been accused of participating in the bombing. In December of 2022, the United States government obtained custody of al-Marimi, who was at that time 71 years old. This individual, beginning at the age of 22 in 1973, was working with bombs for the Libyan intelligence service, and did so for the next 38 years. Though, he would eventually be arrested by Libya, and imprisoned in Misurata, and then moved to Al-Hadba prison in Tripoli. But evidence suggests that he may have been involved in the bombing, and when the United States government obtained custody of him, heads of the Defense and Foreign Affairs Committees of the Libyan Parliament demanded an urgent investigation into his extradition. They felt it was a blatant violation of national sovereignty, as well as the infringement of the rights of a Libyan citizen. Their point was that the case file had been closed politically and legally, according to the text of the agreement signed between the U.S. and Libya back in 2003. And yet, they just came in and took another one of their citizens accused of the bombing. Specifically, al Marimi is being accused of making the bomb. He pled not guilty in February of 2023, and his federal trial is scheduled for May of 2025. So it's still going to be at least another year before we really have any conclusion to this entire story. The whole thing was a mess, and still is. But as for Libya's complaints, I just, I just can't see the United States federal government giving this man back to them. They're not gonna do it. Regardless, the Lockerbie bombing, the Lockerbie disaster, the attack on Flight 103, whatever you decide to call it, was an exceedingly tragic day that still affects lives even now. As I said, many people outside the UK simply don't know or have forgotten about it. 
But I think this is definitely one instance where we should remember. We're talking about the deaths of 270 people. And it didn't have to be this way. But unfortunately, we live in a world where terrorists exist. And do horrific things to innocent people. And with that, a special thank you. Because that's all my underwater train finders. Some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Jack Carson's row of videos, Lord Off444, I Surfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Redlion, NS Productions 8104, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Kenneth Cross White, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Kenneth Ray Waters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, JBL Explorers, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131 232, Mark Holding, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Hayton DeGro, Metal for Life Guy, No, Kurt Forkham, Ohio Trucker 1, Mitchell Cole, Mr. Sleepy, Dr. Racer 78, Williard Conklin, Windy City Rails, DM Travel Typhoon, Harry, Drew Debris, George Kenny, Kevin Wood, Liam Wright, Morris Tillman Productions, NJ1969, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Hannah Bird, Western Colorado History, AET Museum, Ryan Wehofer, Dur Rousey, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.